I get, I sent a survey for to ask about changing the date for the midterm, and I think a number of students had already made other arrangements or had other exams. So there are a number of people with conflicts if we were to change it. So the decision has been, I made the decision to keep it the way we had it, we have it on the syllabus. Um, which means in fact that is going was gonna be, and I will um, make sure that is there for everyone, is we I'm gonna give them the team meet them on Monday after class. You're gonna have to upload it uh, on Wednesday before class. All right, so I will give directions on how to do that. I mean, I will, when I make it available, I will email you also with an announcement, to make sure that everybody understands that uh, this is um, the case. And I will do it also today after I inform both uh, sections. But then, so team exam midterm, um, I will give it on Monday, right after class, you will have to return it on Wednesday, right before class. Um, and then the midterm next week, the individual midterm is gonna be on Friday in class, all right? Um, so that's the decision um, because as I said, even if a number of people would like flexibility, there were a number of students who had serious conflicts. Okay, um, so this is about the meter. Um, other things, so we would like to continue um, with the uh, lectures on um, magnetostatics and everything that we will cover up until say, um, well, everything that we will cover up until Friday will be something that you may see on your team meter. Everything that we will cover up until Wednesday is something that you may see in your individual, next week Wednesday, in your individual meter. I may have also questions, just theoretical questions, all right? It's not necessary, I may have a combination of things. Something to define, tell me what is this, for example. Um, I may have a um, multiple uh, choice question and I may have a problem, all right? So any, not all of them, any of the three, because obviously I will, uh, even for the team, Homework, I will not give you like a homework. It's gonna be like a midterm that normally you would take in class as an individual, but you will take it as a team. So it's, it's not gonna be for like many days kind of thing. It's gonna be if you were to sit down as a team, you would be able to solve it within like 50 minutes at your pace, okay? Um, so that's how I'm gonna design it. But be, um, make sure that you cover the material, you cover the definitions. And as I said, what I promised in both sections, is not gonna be anything different. I mean, it's gonna be something from what I thought. It may be a problem we taught in class. It may be an example we did, a homework problem. It's gonna be something that we have covered and not anything new. The reason I'm doing that is because I think that the number of students have not been able to follow the material in this class. They are far out there. And if I find these students far out there, I need to give them a warning because um, this is, can only get worse, you know, if you already fall behind this much. So that's the reason I will do that. Uh, the final is going to be a different story. It might not necessarily be anything new, but it's going to be a combination of things. But now it's going to be something that we're, you have already seen. And if you tell me that you did not know how to solve it, that tells me that you have not studied. All right, that's how I'm going to take it. So that's why I decided what is happening. I don't have a good sense for the first time that, this, that the number of students in this class are doing well. I have a sense that the number of students in uh, 
I'm not talking about this section, I'm talking about 322, um, are falling behind. And I don't know why. So in any case, um, any questions about the midterm, any clarifications you would like to have before we continue? I just will review what we've done last time and then go on. Okay. So as we said, we are trying to understand, to solve problems, obviously, we will try to make sure that we know the fundamentals of math and um, from electric circuit, the electric circuits or circuits like what you have covered before. And then um, try also to understand what is happening in 3D understand the physics and make connection to what to the things that you have already seen. So um, just to help you understand electromagnetics, electro, electrostatics, magnetostatics, and eventually electromagnetics is everything that you have studied about, but you not necessarily explicitly. So for example, when somebody talks to you in a circuit class about an inductor, what that really implies is that the people who have developed these inductors, single loop inductor is the simplest one, all right? The people who have developed those, who have given you a design formula, like the one that they have here, simplified design formula, they did an analysis of the fields before they got here. So, and they knew, so how did they know to create even that? If they needed, for example, let's assume that somebody knew how to do <clears throat> circuit design, but only symbolically, how to place inductors and capacitors, all right? And then let's assume that somebody had taught, had been taught that an inductor is an element that absorbs a magnetic field. And then a capacitor is an element that stores an electric field. So capacitor stores electric energy, differently, you can think about that. Inductor stores magnetic energy. What does that really mean when we say stores something? What does it mean? You remember when I said that when I talk, when I see lines like this, I think of the magnetic energy flowing some direction. All right. That's what I that's how I connect this um, graphical representation in my mind with some physical meaning, all right? I see lines as ah, the magnetic flux goes this way. That's how I think, and I think this is because energy is something more real than the magnetic field, all right? You remember what we said, we don't even know how fields are propagated. <laughs> so we have created them, we have visualized in them, but in reality, it's flux, is the energy that you can, see that, I mean, that you can measure it at least, energy going from one place to another. In any case, so um, when I see this happen, when we see a small loop, like squeezing together all of these magnetic field lines and forcing the magnetic field to go through this little loop area, what does this really do? It does not store it obviously because the magnetic field lines are going like that. You can think that it's, it's forcing you to come all of this magnetic field to go through this very tiny area, which means that there the flux increases, the flux density. Why is the flux density increasing? Because, I mean, you can think from being all up here, if it, the magnetic field is created by this tiny loop, all of the lines that are coming and they are flowing in the loop. So here, the magnetic flux density gets its highest value, right here. All right, you see how you squeeze all of these lines. And then eventually all of here, they will go all around. So I can think of this loop as storing right there at the center, magnetic energy. And if it's static, all right, Practically, so that this static energy is here. There's a lot of static magnetic energy here. That's why I say that it stores magnetic energy. And look at that. And then we have more, even better, as we will see 
um, next time because they're going to finish some other rooms. Okay. okay, that is the inductor. What did we see about the capacitor? If you remember, when we had the capacitor in two parallel plates, let me also develop a similar graphic for the capacitor. Okay, I will do it here. When we had a capacitor like this, the electric field in this capacitor, because there are going to be plates that are the relative, the ratio of the width to this distance separation between the plates, the width, of, the width over D is a very large number, regardless of how small W is. So if W is 30 microns, which is very small, then D can be 0.1 micron which is even much smaller. So the ratio of W over D is always very large. And what, I, what does this do? All of the field then that is generated, we assume that these are the, connected to a positive hole. So the electric field is gonna go like that here, obviously, because that's gonna be the closest distance when the, where the electrons um, positive on the upper conductor, negative on the lower conductor can come and face each other, all right? And then it will go like this here. Then it's gonna have what we call this edge kind of field, but this one is gonna be much weaker what comes out from, and it's gonna be zero up here because all of the charges face each other. There's nothing out there in terms of other charges. So now when I see these lines, what do I think? Again, I think of electric energy, electric flux, rather, going like this, electric flux lines. And therefore, there is a very high density of electric flux lines right here, as opposed to what you would have if you had only one plate alone. If you had only one plate alone here, Let's assume you had one plate and you had positive charges somehow everywhere around it. If you, if you were to have to put a positive charge on a, on a conductor, how is this, where is this, let's assume, okay, this is a good question to make. And that's a theoretical question, all right? So if you have a, a one piece of a conductor, a plate, a small plate, like, like this one, one of those, okay, not two. And then you would put a positive charge on this, meaning, let me in fact add this to make it add here, a page. So let me take this one on a different page. You don't want to crowd them. Okay. If you have if you were to have only a conductor like this, let me raise now, they make one conductor and then connect it to this one, like that. What would happen to the conductor? It's a conductor, it's a plate, all right? Think for a moment and then tell me how the charges will go. I'm redoing this. Where will the charges be? Okay, so all positive, they come from here. So all of the charges are accumulated here. If this is not connected, so if you have a battery, all right? Here. All right, you have a battery and you connect the battery to a metal. And let's assume that is a strong power source as a matter of fact, instead of a two volt battery. Um, and you connect it here. Yeah. 
if you do not have that, let's assume that I wanna separate it here. So all of the charge will stay there, right? There's no place to go. What if you connect this source to this conductor alone? Then I can charge Yes, and where and why? Why would the charges not stay here, but go and distribute on the surface of the conductor, not inside, because it's a perfect conductor. Nothing goes inside. Remember that, all right? Okay, and the charges will go here. And let's assume <clears throat> that you have enough charges there, so. And, and another question, if I, the charges go there, I have two questions for you. First of all, are they gonna be uniformly distributed or they're gonna all come here or here? Right. Yes, then you would have to balance only one force, which is a fussy force. That's the only thing that, 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 that they feel. Here they were forced to be crowded. Now they're not gonna be on top of each other, but they're gonna be crowded. And then the, the fact that they are already within a, a section and there is nothing else to go, right? Everything's there around them, they're forced to be here. But now that they have more area to distribute on, they're gonna distribute evenly. So they balance the, this and this charge from the other two, which are neighboring charges, has to have the same force that repels them from its side, so then it stabilizes in the middle. All right, so that happens for all of them. Okay. So um, in this case, if I have these kinds of charges, ah, why are they not gonna crowd here? For the same reason, they're not gonna crowd because they're gonna feel more if higher repelling force from one side only. So ideally, you have a very strong force pushing you this way from here, and a much weaker force pushing you this way from there. Where are you gonna go? This way. It's like the rope. Have you seen this rope I go? They say those gates that you play. All right, similar thing. Okay, if you have it like that, how will the field go? The electric flux lines. So. How will the energy try to disperse? The electric energy because obviously creates an electric field, right? How will it look like? From from each of the charts out. Here, like this. Like that, all right. And obviously, like this, that's now at this time. But then it distributes all of these flux everywhere around. What happens if I put another metal similar to that above? I bring it in a very close distance. And then I connect the negative. In fact, here is what I do. I may not. Um, do it directly to the source. I may tell you I do that, I put it to the ground. <clears throat> What's going to happen? I don't even connect it to anyone, just the ground. Yes. Yes. So all of the electrons, there's a lot of electrons here, an infinite manner. Oh, and they're available. <clears throat> all of these electrons, they will start seeing these electric forces and they will start flowing here. Because the electrons <coughs> start flowing here from the upper surface of the conductor to face the, low, the, the positive charges, then all of the other positive charges, because those, you remember what I said? That this distance is much smaller than the width. So where the distance is for, therefore here, the distance between these two, that, that D, and if this is W, where D is much smaller than W. So, when D is much smaller than W, this force here becomes 
very strong, which means that it will overcome the repulsive, excuse me, the repulsive forces between those positive charges. All of the positive charges are going to come under them because those attractive forces are so strong. So what is going to happen? Then all of these positive charges will start coming here. All right, so you're going to see all of these charges here. And then they will leave the upper. All right. And then you're going to see even more electrons coming here to be able to face these additional charges until all of the charges start underneath the conductor and all the electrons. So what happens to this? All of these field lines will then disappear from up here. And they will all come to face the other conductor. So they're going to be like this. So now, that means that all of time, electric energy is concentrating here because all of the electric flux lines are here. And that's why we state that a capacitor stores electric energy. A capacitor stores electric energy. An inductor stores magnetic energy. What happens if you take this capacitor and that other inductor and you connect them? So you have charged the capacitor, you charge it. I, I then remove, what I do is the following. Next question. On the basis of all of what we've learned, all right? Nothing more. Let's assume now that I remove this source and I remove this. What happens to this capacitor? Remains charged. There is no place for this. If you don't have anything connected to it, all of this is going to stay there. Okay. Now I take this capacitor, which is symbolically, I have that, and I connect this capacitor to this inductor that I have up, up there. You see that? So what I do, I take this capacitor and I connect it to my inductor. I will show that it's one loop, all right? Remember, that's why it's not a very fancy inductor, it's one loop. Okay, what is gonna happen? And if you wanna show it, we will never see it like that, because never happens. But if I were to say, okay, then I'm taking this parallel plate capacitor all right which is like this and then what do i do look look at this it's, it's kind of weird but that's what i'm gonna do here i take i connect the wire there another wire here and i put it there so now i have this capacitor here all right now i want you to tell me what's going to happen physics and then i go and put it in this inductor connect it with this inductor all right now the, the dimensions are not relatively how i draw them this is a very very narrow dimension and this is going to be much smaller than the loop, obviously. Okay. And in reality, if it's an inductor, there will be multiple. But let's assume that I do this small experiment in my lab. So, what is going to happen here? But then nothing else. I have this, and then I have that. I took this, put it there, and I took my other inductor. What do you think is going to happen? So the charges 
obviously there is here an open area. The tide is there's going to be a flow of tides, all right? So practically, why is it going to be a flow of tides? Because this time people like to come and move like this one, if they can find their way there. So what happens is that the tide is flow, they create, an, <coughs> they create a current, and the current creates magnetic field. And then what, what it happens is if there are no losses, this magnetic field, because you will see, we have not really done that, but because of the creation of the magnetic field, there's going to be a voltage called the VMF. We are going to see it after that applies an outlier across here. And then it's going to recharge the capacitor. That's a recharge the capacitor, then this goes down. So when you connect a capacitor to an inductor, then there is a flow of energy from the capacitor the inductor and the reverse. So you have an LC circuit. All right? This is an LC. So the LC, how do you show it like that? In fact, it's going to be practically because it's not, it's going to be like this. All right? And in the LC circuit, if you do not have any losses, it's going to take forever. This is going to run around, which is not happening because there are losses in every material system. But it's going to keep going. This, this thing is called the resonator. All right? Because why? Because there is a time constant that characterizes how fast this capacitor discharges and how fast this loop where the current uh, flies around creates this EMF voltage that recharges the capacitor. And those two time constants, all right, they're going to um, indicate that there is one particular frequency if we go out of statics, obviously, where this one is going to be a true balance between this, the, the exchange between electric and magnetic field is going to sustain forever. And that's called the resonance of this LC that you probably have seen it since. But this is what happens, all right? So all of these things that we have seen and implemented in circuits practically come from a physical understanding of what happens in these devices. So um, with that in mind, I, I, even if we will see some of those things, at least VMF we'll see later, all right? VMF is not the EMF is not excited unless you have some kind of a time variance. And the moment that the capacitor discharges, there is a time involved, obviously. That's why you see the EMF. If the capacitor is not discharging, it's like that constant, of course, you're not going to see an exchange between electric and magnetic. Okay? That happens when time variations come into play. Remember what I said, when charges move with time varying velocity, which is going to happen when the capacitor is connected to the inductor. That's when we see a connection between the electric and magnetic. But on the basis of what the capacitor does, which is to store electric energy, the, the inductor does is to store magnetic energy. When you put them together, you create a new effect. It's called the resonance. And, and then so that is the physical understanding of all of these things. When last year, I have to tell you, you're not going to laugh, we are without saying that. When I, I asked in the final last year, what is a, an LC resonance? Or what is a resonance? I don't remember. We had a similar thing. They, they, they gave me the definition of a mechanical resonance of a pendulum. Others of a string that is moving, which is all true, all right? But they, they, people went into, I think, to see the disconnect between, and I'm not surprised because every, it's like during this kind of your studies where you try to, you are in a space that is all not exactly compartmentalized well. And maybe some concepts are kind of mixing with other concepts, all right? So it's, it's natural, it happens, but I wanted to make sure that um, I connect you to things that you have heard before. So you develop that kind of uh, better understanding. All right, so now what I would like to do next 
is to go from this problem here, which we have solved and then we have found in all of these problems, in all the loops, keep in mind one thing. In all of the loops, the only place where we are going to look for the electric field is the center of the loop. Whether the loop is circular, rectangular, or something else, we are going to look for that at the axis of the loop. So, to, um, we were able to solve the uh, circular loop problem easily, all right? So we've done this before. However, if this loop changes from a circular form to any other form, even if it's on the plane, let's assume that it has some kind of symmetry, let's assume it's a square, all right? That has a nice symmetry in the X, Y, and Z system. We cannot um, solve the problem the way we did before. We will have to go and solve the problem the way we did it in charges. And how did we find the electric field from a rectangular charge? Charge from a, a yes, rectangular charge. We first of all found the electric field from a line segment of particular length. Right? That is in charges. That's how we did it. So now we are going to do exactly the same thing and try to find the magnetic field from a segment of current. Even if we know that the current cannot start doing this stuff there, as charges can, all right? I, I can have a rod, metallic rod, which is from here there, and the charges apply on its surface. I can do that. Physically, I can go to the lab take a, a metallic rod and charge it. But with current, you cannot have a section of current sitting there, okay, in this space. So what we do is that we consider this section is a mathematical tool. We consider this section, we find that we from this section, and then if we have other loops that look not circular, but different, then we make them up out of connected sections of current. Right? Like a square. So, find this. First of all, we need to remember a few um, formulas. This one, and I'm not going to do here, as you can see, the whole derivation, because my goal here is not to teach you how to um, do integrations, which is a great thing if you can do it on your own. If you find out that you have difficulty doing an integration, then you will have to review that. We're not going to do integrations in class. This is not the math class, all right? So I'm going to give you the formula, but the, the derivations are in the book. And if you want, we can join me some other time and we can go through the derivation if you want somewhere else. Oh, by the way, for our class 322, and they told me that there is the uh, student services offers tutoring on math and on other things if you need something for free. All right. So, in any case, they do it for fundamental courses. I think so. I'll see one of them. This, if I consider the four section of current, A, B, B. And then I take for this a fundament and an infinitesimally small, small section, this one. So I take an infinitesimally small section and then I ask the question, what will the field be out of this infinitesimally small section of current? And Joseph Abar has told us already how much is going to be. So practically, the way I find it, is to go here, connect this vector to the point of interest. This is, this is the observation point. And then the Osabar law tells us that an infinitesimally small current is going to create an infinitesimally small magnetic field at this point. And this magnetic field is going to be given by this formula, which is very similar if you think it goes. You remember, we said it goes as. One over the distance squared. Here it shows us cube in the denominator because we use vector r in the numerator. But it is one over d over distance squared. Okay. And then that's where I start 
placing down these expressions, you know, I write vector r. I like, I write this vector here, r, in terms of the cylindrical coordinate systems, and it's here. And then I replace that and this is the magnitude. And then I replaced this within the Biosavart law and I get this integral. If I wanna now integrate along the direction of the finite segment A to B. And if I do that, so for A, we have a Z component, we have a Z coordinate Z sub A because I integrate along the Z direction. And then it goes from A to B. So I have Z sub B as the coordinate for the B point. And then that integral, you see there, it gives me this expression where? Alpha sub A in this expression is this angle bringing A to B, this line, and outside of this area, all right? So it connects to minus z, is between minus z, the, the line that goes to minus z, and the line that connects point A to an observation point B, right here, A sub alpha sub A. And then alpha sub B is the angle that connects the line that goes towards minus z, with the line that connects point B to point P. If you pay attention to these lines, all right, it's important to pay attention where they are. And then if you plug them in there, you can always get the magnetic field from a particular section of pattern. Any questions so far? So with that, on Wednesday, we're going to solve this problem. This problem, and that's what I'm going to stop saying, is that that's a simple implementation right, of the previous one. Why? Because this square is made out of four sections. So if I wanted to find here the magnetic field from each section, I will go and then start with a and then if I plug in the formula, the only thing that I need to remember is to measure this angle, this angle, alpha b for this particular case, because it's a square and because I measure it at the center of a square, this is 45 degree and this is 45 degree, all right? Square, the square. This one is equal to that one, all right? That's not true for another parallelogram, but for a square, this angle is 45 degrees. And then I, sub I, I substitute in my formula. All right, so I substitute here. And then I find the magnetic field out of one section. But then let's think what happens at that moment. I don't go blindly through math and I'm doing blindly all the math for each one of them. That's where physics helps. Because then you go and say, okay, if the current goes like this, if the current goes to the positive from A to B, then my electric field is gonna come out of the board, right? Electric, the, excuse, magnetic field at point O is going to come out of the board. So the magnetic field at this point due to AB is going to look like that. Put it here. The magnetic field due to BC is going to also look the same. The magnetic field due to current along C, from C to D is also going to look the same. So all of the magnetic fields, like it shows here, for each one of the sections, they all come out of the board. So they all sum up. And because each of these 
lines are identical because I'm looking at the center of the rectangular shape of the square. Specifically, this one, A, B to the center O, is a triangle that is like the orthogonal. As it is this one, as it is this one, and all of these, these four triangles are identical, which means that each one of these fields, they go along the same direction and they're equal. So I make it four times. So my total field is four times. And that's how I find it. All right. So um, I would like any to see if you have any questions about this. Okay. Now, um, can I make a rectangular loop? Of course, as a matter of fact, most of the loops in integrated circuits are rectangular. And it's, like, we will see a few, but they are one like a spider, one inside the other. So that more, when we come to that, we are gonna discuss. So the last few minutes, I would like to start talking about a um, different topic where we have um, two particular, I don't know why it's a so here. Erase it for a moment. Okay, second. All right, so um, let's assume now we have, do you remember what before we talk? Let me start before I talk about this. Do you remember what happened when we had not only one current line, but two? Okay. When we have two of those, depending on the orientation of the current, of the two currents, we had uh, different fields, magnetic fields, that were excited in between them. So obviously, what happens is when you have two currents that create two separate magnetic fields, there is an interaction between them. All right? And this interaction, well, you saw, for example, in the particular case where we had the two lines with the, field, with the currents going in the same direction, what we found is that the fields outside were strong and inside the two were kind of weak, very weak. And then when we changed the directions of the currents, we found that the field in between them got very strong and outside was very weak and in, my, in fact, in, well, then we started talking not so much about the field, but about the flux. We said the flux was strong outside for the two lines that had the same direction to current lines. And for the other two that had opposite direction, the flux was much stronger in between flux lines. Now we are going to have one current line like this. And then in this one, we're going to bring a loop. The interesting thing about this loop is that it is not, is not connected to any source, okay? And um, then we would like to see that if we have a um, one particular current and inside another loop, for example, we would like to see, first of all, how much of the flux of this current goes through this loop. And then from there, we can find um, later what happens if you have two of these currents and how they impact each other. But in the beginning, we would like now to find out if our current lies here along this direction, how much flux goes through this area. Okay, in the beginning, it's not connected. So how would I find this? 
to find the plaques, and that is also based on what we've done before. To find the plaques that goes through this area, you will have to find practically the field, the magnetic field lines that go perpendicular to this area. All right? And why is that? The flux through an area. So let me write here. So flux through loop is practically given by the integral, let's call it this, psi one L or, or like psi L, excuse me, sorry. L is gonna be the surface integral on the surface of the loop, all right, of the magnetic field lines from the current because all of the only the current here develops anything. Inner product of DSL. Now this loop has a direction. The, the surface of this loop has a direction, right? You remember every surface has a direction. So let's assume if we are in the X, Y, and Z coordinate system, that the surface, the surface of the loop has a direction along the positive X. So Isabel is gonna be x or a sub x, that's the direction, that, that's the unit vector. S. All right. And then I will have to find the forces that go down the x direction. I will have since the loop is this particular loop is on the z y plane. All right. So the direction is here. Then I will have to find the inner product between the magnetic field that is created by this current and the surface, which means that I will have to find only the x components of the magnetic field, all right, on the surface, and integrate them. But on the surface, the way I have to get the surface, you know what happens? The x direction components of B on the surface they are nothing else but the pi components on the cylindrical coordinate system. All right? And as a matter of fact, the x direction in this um, rectangle in the XYZ system, so A sub x here is minus A sub phi. Why is that? Because if the positive z-axis is this, and the phi coordinate always has that direction. So the phi here goes inside the board, you see that? So the phi direction is the negative of the x. So in that particular case, I will, if I do the integral, it's gonna give me a negative value, but this negative value means that the flux goes inside the board, that's all. The negative value is implies the direction in relation to the positive x is opposite. So the opposite direction to the positive x is what goes inside the wall. So all of the flux here goes inside the wall and to find it, we will have to integrate here. And the integration, as we will see next time, in fact, is, it's not going to be like the area times one number because the field, the field changes as we go from the index. So we will see that because that is important later on in some circuits we do, okay? So um, I will give you one, I will turn on one uh, exercise for Friday. Okay, so check your um, tab pad for Friday. Any questions? I don't think so. All right, thank you. Yes. Um, the top half, uh, uh, the coil forwards, uh, and so I thought the magnetic field inside, like the cylinder is zero, right? Oh. 
And there's a current that flows, you see that? The answer is this to show you here. The answer is the magnetic field along the axis of the cylinder, specifically at point P, is stronger. Ah, uh, this is not a pulley. This is, has a pole. You see how it goes? It's like a, a, a it's like a thin sheet of uh, current goes like this. The magnetic lines go like if the current flows like if the current flows like this, it goes like that. The magnetic field goes out like this because the current, the current see, it goes like that. Inside. So the current goes like this. See? To the magnetic field. No, can you take it at the same time from where you are? Yes. It's from where you are. But it's gonna be open. Oh, oh my no, I don't need to. Okay. Just take it at the same time. All right. Good. I mean it's okay. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 